In this lecture, we'll be examining the fall of the Aztec Empire, which once dominated the region of Mesoamerica. We'll consider the major events that led up to the defeat of the Aztecs by the Spanish, and we will discuss the significant causes of the fall of the Aztecs. We will also address some of the myths that have developed over time about this series of events. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish, the Aztec Empire dominated large areas of Mesoamerica. The Aztec Empire was about the size of the American state of Montana. Subjects of the Aztecs likely numbered about 5 million people, and the capital city of Tenochtitlan had a population of about 200,000 people in 1519. The Aztecs ruled over affiliated city-states that paid tribute and the Aztec army was essentially a tool to keep these city-states in the Aztec orbit and to keep paying tribute. The Aztec emperor was elected by a group of four nobles and emperors were generally brothers or sons of the previous emperor. There exist a number of theories about the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl which is pictured here. Nahuatl accounts written after the fall of Tenochtitlan describe a legend that Matsuma may or may not have believed. By tradition, Quetzalcoatl wore a white mask and grew a beard because he thought he was ugly. There was an associated prophecy in which he would someday return to claim his throne back. Some accounts suggest that Matsuma may have believed Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés to have been the returning Quetzalcoatl. We should note again that these accounts were recorded after the fall of Tenochtitlan, and this may have been a case in which the Spanish conquest influenced Nahuatl legends. The leader of the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs was Hernán Cortés, pictured here. He was born in 1485 in Extremadura, Spain. Extremadura was a hot and dry region, still is. At the time, it had few economic opportunities beyond sheep and cattle herding. It is not surprising that a number of conquistadors came from this region. Um, I liken it to, so, to a place like Wyoming that's uh, somewhat remote and, um, and uh, not so hospitable to most forms of agriculture. Uh, Pizarro, Francisco Pizarro, also came from this region. Cortez was the son of a minor noble and he studied the law as a young man. He arrived in Hispaniola in 1503 and became mayor of the town of Santiago, Cuba in 1514. In 1519, he led an expedition to the Mexican coast that the Spanish governor Velazquez attempted to override at the last minute. In a legal sense, uh, the Cortes mission was a rogue or could even be considered a mutinous expedition. Cortes commanded 11 ships carrying 500 soldiers along with some cannon and horses. His first stop was the Yucatan Peninsula. He next founded the town of Veracruz, which means the True Cross. Cortes actually scuttled his fleet in an effort to discourage his men from trying to return to Cuba. One of the most important figures of the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs was a Nahua woman known as La Malinche, pictured here. She is also known by the Spanish name of Doña Marina. She was one of 20 slaves given to Cortes by citizens of the Tabascan city and province in 1519. La Malinche may have been royalty and she later became the mistress of Cortez, who was supposed to be quite beautiful. She gave birth to the first son of Cortez, a boy named Martin. La Malinche's most significant contribution though was her command of languages. She knew Spanish, Nahua, and several other Mesoamerican languages, and her ability to serve as a translator was of immense importance to Cortez in terms of information gathering as well as communicating with potential allies against the Aztecs. One of the principal allies of Cortes were the Tlaxcalans, who were located in the Altiplano region of Mesoamerica. Cortes stayed in Tlaxcala for 20 days and forged an alliance with the Tlaxcalans to bring down Tenochtitlan. Cortes added about 6,000 Tlaxcala warriors to his ranks and arrived in Tenochtitlan in November 1519. At the time of the arrival of Hernán Cortés, Cholula was second only to Tenochtitlan as the largest city in central Mexico. 
It had a population of up to 100,000 people. This city was a major religious center in Mesoamerica. In addition to the Great Temple of Quetzalcoatl and various palaces, the city had over 350 other religious temples. At the city-state of Cholula, Cortes led an attack on the largely undefended city. There is disagreement in the historical sources as to the cause of the killings, which may have been as many as 30,000 people. Cortes claimed about 3,000 other sources uh, in, into the tens of thousands. The Tlaxcalans claimed that their ambassador had been sent to Cholula and was tortured by the Cholulans. Thus, Cortes had avenged the ambassador's death by attacking Cholula. The Cholulans themselves blamed the Tlaxcalans, claiming the Tlaxcalans resented Cortes going to Cholula instead of their religious center of Fuexotzingo. Cortes, um, in his letter to Charles V, claimed that the Cholulans treated him with disrespect and needed to be punished. And he also claimed that the Cholulans were setting a trap for the Spanish on behalf of the Aztecs. Cortes attempted to get word to the Aztecs afterward that if they uh, treated him with respect and with gifts of gold, they need not fear his wrath. Moctezuma was at the time well aware of the presence of Cortes and his forces, having uh, a well-established communication system between Tenochtitlan and the coast, and he prepared for the arrival of the Spanish. Founded in 1325 CE, Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire. The city's name means something like among the prickly pears growing among the rocks. And it connotates a sense of uh, a, a sort of barren area prior to the arrival of the Aztecs. They were a, uh, the Mexica, that is, the uh, Aztec is the name of the empire, the Mexica were the name of the uh, ethnic group that uh, became the um, leadership of the Aztec empire. Um, in the early 14th century, the Mexica were a very small ethnic group, and the only place they could sort of set up shop was on this small island in Lake Texcoco. The heart of the city was in the middle of this island, which is about five square miles. Um, they actually um, added um, some land through land reclamation projects. The island was connected to the mainland by a series of causeways leading north, south, and west from the island. The causeways were intersected by bridges, and canoes and other traffic passed freely underneath. The bridges could also be removed if necessary to defend the city and the city was interlaced with a series of canals. All sections of the city could be visited either on foot or via canoe. Among the city's many technological marvels was a levee system, which was completed in the 1450s. The levee kept spring-fed fresh water in the waters around Tenochtitlan and kept brackish waters beyond the dikes. Pictured here, you can see uh, the system of causeways and bridges connecting um, the island to uh, the mainland and uh, the city center of Tenochtitlan. The Spaniards marveled at the size and the beauty of the city of Tenochtitlan when they arrived and they compared it to nothing like they'd ever seen in Europe. Uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo was a soldier in the army of Cortes and certainly no friend of Cortes. In fact, he wrote his account to counter what he believed to be falsifications or distortions in the historical record committed by Cortes. So both Cortes and uh, Diaz Castillo, del Castillo um, were very laudatory about Tenochtitlan. Um, he, he wrote that uh, when we saw all those towns and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, we were astounded. These great towns and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all just a dream. It was all so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed of before. Bernal Diaz del Castillo. Moctezuma II was the Aztec emperor at the time of the arrival of the Spanish. Sometimes his name is spelled with an N, and that's due to a discrepancy in the Nahua language, the transliteration between uh, Roman characters and the Nahua language. So it's like a Moctezuma. Uh, his title was Hue Tlatuani, which you can see in the first line here, meaning he who speaks well or great speaker. Uh, this was a highly prized skill, and it was, uh, it was expected that political leaders would be uh, would be great orators. 
Bernal Diaz de Castillo provides a description of uh, Moctezuma II as follows. He was about 40 years old, of good height, well proportioned, spare and slight, and not particularly dark. He did not wear his hair long, but just over his ears. And he had a short black beard, well shaped and thin. I think this um, image, uh, this depiction here, best uh, describes what Moctezuma looked like at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards. The court of Moctezuma II far surpassed any comparable royal courts in Europe at that time. Moctezuma had about 3,000 servants, uh, 200 guards at the main palace, and a large group of concubines. Uh, by legend, no one was allowed to look him in the face or to touch him. And also, according to legend, in 1517, a comet appeared in the night sky. This event was supposedly interpreted as evidence of the Quetzalcoatl myth and that the god Quetzalcoatl was planning his return to claim his throne. Uh, the comet legend is another event that may have been influenced by the post-conquest world, and I've been unable to find... Um, astronomical charts that indicate that there was a significant comet event um, in this time period of 1517 to 1519. Uh, Halley's Comet comes a few years later, and there's another comet, uh, I believe, that, will, that uh, was in 1506, but no major comets seem to have, have been um, in the night sky at that time. There are differences between the Spanish and Aztec accounts of the first meeting between Moctezuma and Cortes. Aztec accounts suggest that Cortes bowed before Moctezuma in submission, while Spanish accounts suggest the two met on more equal terms. Of course, the Spanish account we have uh, mostly to, uh, to attribute to uh, Cortes himself, who, of course, uh, is trying to put himself in the best light for Charles V, the emperor. According to Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the two men met uh, November 8th of 1519 on the causeway leading into Tenochtitlan, and the two leaders exchanged gifts. Moctezuma gave Cortez an Aztec calendar made of silver and gold plates. Um, Bernal Diaz del Castillo claims that uh, Cortez melted those down for the bullion later. We don't know if that's true or not. The Spanish and their allies numbered about 4,000 men at this time, and there was a great strain on the city to house, feed, and entertain Cortez and his allies. Cortes left Tenochtitlan to deal with a rival Spanish force that had been sent by Governor Velazquez to arrest him. Again, remember that uh, his, his expedition was technically one of mutiny, and uh, this was sort of an all-or-nothing moment for, uh, for Cortes. Despite being outnumbered three to one, Cortes defeated Panfilo de Narvaez and the new Spanish force, and many of the new soldiers joined his army, Panfilo de Narvaez uh, being away in chains. While Cortes was away, the remaining Spanish and allied forces, forces began to get increasingly on edge, and there were frequent rumors of plots to kill the Spanish. The backdrop to what became known as the Toshcatl Massacre was a traditional Aztec festival that was being held in the main temple. The Spanish accounts indicate that the conquistadors acted to end human sacrifice at the festival. They were so outraged as Christians, they stepped in to end this, um, this bloodbath. The Aztecs, however, uh, claimed that the Spanish, the Spanish were enticed into action by gold, the Aztecs were, that they were greedy. Um, my personal um, interpretation is that, uh, uh, the, that there was a communication uh, breakdown between the two parties, that the Spanish um, overreacted to, um, to the ceremony and uh, things got out of hand really quickly, particularly um, due to the fact that Cortez was not here and uh, the, the men that he left in charge were not nearly as uh, talented as uh, Cortez as a military commander. As many as 600 people were killed in the Toscatl Massacre. Some sources suggest over a thousand dead. More importantly though, most of these were nobles, military leaders, and political leaders. So this, this event uh, uh, created quite a bit of political chaos. Uh, here's an Aztec account of the massacre, a short description. The Spanish surrounded our dancers and then set upon the drummers. One had his hands severed, and then they struck off his head. They charged the crowd and hacked at us with their iron swords. They cut us to pieces. The blood ran like water, and so the war broke out. Cortes returned to Tenochtitlan after dealing with the uh, rival Spanish force. 
to find the city in an uproar. Moctezuma was being held hostage in his own palace by the Spanish and their allies. At the same time, though, the Spanish were essentially trapped in Moctezuma's palace. Remember, this is a city of uh, about 200,000 people, and there were more from the countryside who had uh, moved into the city to see the, the spectacle of the Spanish and to, to, to wait and see what was going to happen to Moctezuma. Uh, there are differing accounts of the death of Moctezuma. Um, the Spanish accounts claim that Moctezuma was killed by stones thrown from the crowd while he spoke at a balcony, as depicted in this image here. The Aztecs, however, claim that the Spanish killed Moctezuma themselves. Moctezuma's brother, Cuitlahuac, was elected Tlatuani, or emperor, but he ruled for just 80 days and died shortly thereafter of smallpox. Qua uh, Temoc took power in 1520 as the successor of Cuitlahuac, and he was a cousin of Moctezuma II, and his young, knife, young wife was actually one of Moctezuma's daughters. So there's a... Uh, significant disruption in uh, political leadership for the Aztecs at this time. The death of Moctezuma left Cortes and the Spanish in an extremely difficult situation, no longer <laughs> having a hostage and needing to get out of the city to regroup. Uh, Cortes decided to break out of the city one night and the Spanish attempted to carry away tons of gold and other valuables but they were attacked by Aztecs in canoes and barges as depicted in this image. Some exit causeways were destroyed, and several hundred conquistadores and uh, thousands of allies were killed. La noche triste, the sad night. Cortes regrouped in the city of Tlaxcala, his old allies. He returned with thousands more native allies and Spaniards. The Spanish siege of Tenochtitlan, though, was significantly aided by a smallpox epidemic that struck in 1519 to 1520. Tens of thousands of residents of Tenochtitlan died in the epidemic. The city of Tenochtitlan finally fell on uh, the 13th of August in 1521. The image on this slide illustrates the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs as depicted by artist Diego Rivera in 1951. Traditionally, the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs um, by historians was attributed um, to items like steel swords and armor, as well as the Spanish use of guns, horses, and war dogs. Certainly we can't discount um, the advantages technology provides, but technology usually can either be co-opted or it can be uh, imitated. So it usually um, these, are, these are only short-term benefits. Um, traditional explanations of the fall of the Aztecs also highlight such items as the supposedly superior military tactics of the Spanish, uh, the alleged superiority of Spanish culture, and even the role of Christianity, or God was on their side. These are some of the traditional explanations. However, historians today emphasize other reasons for Spanish successes. The introduction of Eurasian diseases, especially smallpox, as we discussed, devastated indigenous societies. In addition, the imperial structure of the Aztecs was a top-down sort of system in which local governance was largely decentralized and left in place. And the supplanting of the Spanish to place the Aztecs at the top of the structure was relatively smooth. For people underneath, uh, subject peoples, uh, the Spanish were just the latest in a new line of imperial peoples. But finally, resentments held by many subject peoples against the Aztecs meant that the Spanish had no difficulty finding disgruntled populations who wished to join the Spanish in their fight against the Aztecs. <laughs> 